Good to see people. Glenn, is Marcelo there to you? No, he's uh, trying to make breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> good, good morning. Hi, Jimmy. Hi, John. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. I think people are still kind of getting attached, so we're going to wait a couple minutes and let everyone get in. Is 9 a.m. too early for folks? Obviously, you you are all here. So I guess I'm asking the wrong group, huh? <laughs> it was just enough time to get to the bakery and back. <laughs> Good point. Yes. I had to, I took my son to baseball and he's going to be hanging out at Riki waiting for me because it ends at 10. So we'll, he'll be fine. All right, so we've got um, some of my staff. I, I haven't introduced you all to everyone, so we'll just, um, we'll just do that at the beginning and wait for a couple more minutes to let some folks um, catch up with us. Lauren is usually faceless she's, um, in here. She never is on, so I'm gonna introduce her while she's, Lauren is um, one of my legislative assistants and has been incredible. Um, and Nico Salter is um, our new chief of staff who we're really excited to have on. So welcome, Nico. This Hi, everyone. <laughs> and then Peter is not showing himself today. He looks like me. Um, Peter, not going to say anything. Oh, Good there morning, he is. everyone. <laughs> and Kate is also faceless. So this is my team. Good morning. <laughs> Um, and I'm super grateful because these are the folks that are keeping everything happening. And um, we have done some incredible work this last week. So I'm excited to share what's happening. Um, but we are kind of hitting our stride and learning what we're supposed to be doing. And everyone's kind of found their, their spot. So it's, it's been really great to have these folks on board. So usually on Saturday morning, we're not all here together. So it's fun to get to introduce them to everybody. Um, so let's go ahead. It's 904. By the time we get to the end, there'll have been time for a couple more people if they join to join. So I'm just going to do the usual. I'd love to kind of find out um, who's with us, what you want to talk about this morning, any, you know, top questions and, um, you know, anything else you want to share about you, we'll go through. And I'm going to just say people as they show up on my screen. So Glenn, you're, you're the first one that I see. Oh, wow. So, so what did you want us to say? Just who we are? Who you are and what you want to talk about or okay. anything I, well, about no, you? I, nothing in particular. Um, there is one issue I want to talk about, but I don't know if I want to talk about it today yet. <laughs> but uh, it's, And it's more of a local issue, but we'll talk about it maybe another time or if there's if we run out of questions. But I'm a neighborhood resident and uh, um, live in Willamette Heights. So, Great. It's good to see you. Jimmy, you're next. I'm, uh, I'm Jimmy Unger. I'm, uh, I guess, a retired pediatrician now. Uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, here mainly just to listen and learn. I, uh, at some point, am interested in kind of picking your brain about the, uh, the tabling of the, uh, the bill that would uh, get rid of non-medical exemptions for uh, vaccine, vaccines. Um, it could be a topic for today or another day. Okay. Uh, but that's one of my areas of interest. Very good. We'll definitely try to touch on that. So remind me if we're getting towards the end and I haven't remembered. Uh, Lauren's nodding knowingly, so she's on it. All right, John McDonald, good morning. Hey, uh, good morning, I'm John McDonald. I live in uh, Forest Heights neighborhood and I'm just here to see what's going on. <laughs> it's good to have you, thanks for joining us. Mark, good morning. Good morning, my name is Mark Schrupper. I'm originally from the Netherlands, that explains my accent. But I have already tried for 20 years living here to get rid of it. Uh, my, my interest today is mostly uh, COVID and the response of the, um, the government to it. And my worry is that three months before we can all get vaccinated, we let the virus out of the box. And uh, so I would like to remind, I, I, I remember Schindler's List at the end, it says, whoever saves one life saves the world entire. 
And now it seems like uh, how many deaths are acceptable? Uh, it's it's really weird to me it's, uh, what has happened to us. Um, so anything on that is in my interest. Okay, we'll definitely talk about COVID. So thank you. Um, and I love your accent, so don't oh, get rid of Yeah, <laughs> Linda Craig, it's good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have been following primarily the climate-related bills and energy efficiency bills, uh, but I'm also very interested in what the BIPOC caucus is doing. So those are the topics I'd love to have you uh, touch on today. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Sherry, good morning. It's good to see you. Hey, hi, Maxine. So I'm just, I look forward to these twice a month updates and I kind of would love to hear your thoughts on uh, walkouts. Great, okay. Well, let's and whether we can get anything done. We're hoping, <laughs> we'll talk about it. <laughs> okay, good. And Corey Wind, are you there? Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm trying to multitask and make breakfast for the family at the same time. Um, but yeah, hi, Rep Dexter. Um, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I live in the Oak Hills area and I just kind of want to keep up with session. Um, I do work for DEQ. So I listened to the bill uh, earlier this week um, and just, um, 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 I'm, I'm in air quality and climate, so. Excellent. Well, we're excited to have you. We'll definitely tap your knowledge a little bit as we talk about that bill. It's one of our big ones. So that's yeah. great. Thank you. So um, I will just kind of give a quick overview. You know, we like to start with what we accomplished in the last week. Um, and then the vaccine update is always something that I'd like to try to touch on too. So um, just as far as vaccines, you know, everyone probably is aware at this point that we're at 65 and older, everyone's um, eligible. And um, it's been a moving target as far as how people sign up. We switched to the getvaccinated.organ.gov um, website. And that's a link that if you go to the COVID vaccine part of the OHA's webpage, that it automatically takes you to basically what's a sign up um, to get a lottery ticket. And then they contact you as you get randomly chosen to make your appointment. Um, I think it's working pretty well from what I've heard. Um, they have changed it. So when you sign up, you get a confirmation that you're signed up. At first that wasn't happening. And so people were a little confused, but um, you can sign up for that and then still try to make appointments at Costco and Walgreens and Albertsons and Safeway and all those other pharmacies. And I've heard a lot of folks having um, pretty good luck. Um, there's all kinds of intel out there about whether it's afternoons at Walgreens and morning at Costco. You know, I don't know what the download uh, is, but um, what I think is the reality is that our seniors who either are personally um, web savvy or have family that are web savvy and have good connectivity or have an advantage. And my major concern is that that's really left behind. Um, our English language learners and our, our seniors who don't have the access to those um, tools. I know for my mother-in-law um, who we signed up a couple weeks ago, there's no way that she would have been able to navigate um, the website and the wrap, like you had to make a decision about your appointment immediately or it was gone. So um, a lot of grandkids are signing up, you know, not just their grandparents, but friends and others. Um, so hopefully people are having an okay time with that. And I'd love to get feedback about that. Um, as far as our bills, we've got our first work session coming up this next week, which means you've had the public hearing, the chair of the committee is supportive of your bill moving to the floor and is taking it to the committee for a vote. And if the committee supports it, then it moves to the floor. And what I've learned is that it's not a guaranteed once you've had a public hearing um, and you've got the votes that it'll actually go for a work session because sometimes if the speaker and the committee chair don't think that there's really a path for it passing in the house or if it's not a priority bill, then it can get delayed. So I'm excited that our first bill 3037, which is a youth suicide reporting bill is gonna um, get heard at the behavioral health committee 
for his final work session on um, the 10th. And then um, as Corey alluded to or spoke to, um, 2814 is our air quality bill and it's an indirect sources regulation bill that was heard at the Environment and Energy, Energy and Environment Committee um, this week. It's a really big deal. So 74% of diesel emissions in the Portland metro area come from off-road sources. So rail yards, um, construction sites, um, those uh, distribution centers like for Amazon and different groups. So we have a bill that would allow DEQ to regulate those indirect sources as a geographic location rather than out of the tailpipe. So right now for on-road diesel emissions, it's really the engines that we're regulating, but this would allow for regulation of a geographic area. So um, that bill uh, got a great um, hearing. It's carried over for public testimony on Monday. So if you are so inclined, Linda and others, um, to testify to the bill either in written or verbal form, uh, that's happening um, Monday afternoon. Um, and we would love all the support we can get. Um, 2543 is uh, the Charleston loophole bill that I'm co-sponsoring and that is a bill that would uh, eliminate the three day um, time uh, restriction for background checks for gun sales. And so um, Rep Reynolds is the chief sponsor on that bill and um, Rep Graber and I spoke to it this week in the um, Judiciary Committee, which is my committee. So we'll see if that moves forward for a work session or not. It's um, It had a pretty good debate and I know Jerry, you were probably paying attention. So I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on it as we kind of get into a more open forum here in just a few minutes. Um, 3035 is one of my team's major priority bills. It's a um, Department of Corrections healthcare uh, bill that would allow for a pilot project to start at Coffee Creek, which is the women's um, detentional facility. And right now, um, adults in custody you know, they have full health care and they have um, constitutional rights to, you know, comprehensive health care. But sometimes folks aren't very savvy and, and don't necessarily know how to work in a system that is completely new to them. And so we have a bill that would a, establish um, health care navigators that would actually make sure that they understand what is available and also help coordinate the transfer of care from their outpatient to um, in the correctional facility and then back when they go out. And there's a lot of fragmented care and a lot of um, lapses in, in some of the things that are available at times. So the navigators I think would be an impressive improvement for at least informing our adults in custody. And then it also um, creates some accountabilities for the Department of Corrections for reporting uh, different outcomes and whatnot, because right now they don't even have an electronic health record, which is also part of the bill is to make sure that they can keep track of data and, and get that um, streamlined with the outpatient setting. So that one has a hearing on the 9th, um, and we are excited about uh, that bill. And then the last one is an outdoor worker protection bill 2813, which was scheduled for a hearing on Monday. We just found out yesterday afternoon that that was canceled. So we're not sure when that's gonna get rescheduled, but that's really thinking about our uh, migrant farm workers and our road workers and those folks who are outdoors all the time for their jobs. And when air quality is bad, such as with the wildfires, it um, requires employers to provide um, N95s, which everyone's used to talking about these days or more uh, comprehensive uh, res respirators. All right, so that's a lot. Um, I'd love to kind of get feedback on those bills and hear thoughts um, before we move on to the other topics because you know this is what I'm doing for our district. This is the work we're engaged in and I'd love to hear what people think about it. Linda, please. Yeah. So regarding 2814, um, has it attracted the attention of those who would prefer that it not pass? Are you getting a lot of pushback? And um, in terms of preparing testimony, are there particular areas that you would suggest we speak to? Thank you. Yeah, so um, the major 
folks who are concerned about it are construction um, companies and, and the um, trade unions uh, because construction is so core to their, um, you know, having jobs for people. So of course we don't want to kill the construction industry, but the concern is that, you know, they've put enormous amounts of investment into these construction um, equipment vehicles that have these diesel engines that live forever. You know, some of these um, date back, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. And so clearly um, the, the differences in, efficiency is is problematic. And so their concern is that they'll have to buy new equipment. There is retrofitting. And then there's also um, uh, Rep Power has um, some alternative fuel source bills and a, a diesel bill that she's put forth trying to move us to um, less carbon emitting fuels. Um, so that there might be some balance there that, you know, if there's an alternative fuel source or there's a rolling in period or some retrofitting that we can help um, support that, you know, let me take a step back. The yes, people are um, to your, your question. Yes, there is some uh, rallying against this. This, the point that I should really make is that this is not a regulata regulation establishing bill. What it does is, is gives DEQ the authority to do the regulation and they would go through a very um, robust stakeholder um, process, engagement process to establish the rules. So our bill doesn't establish the regulations. It just establishes that DEQ starts the process and also gives them um, the ability to fine those who are polluting. So pay to pollute kind of um, policy. And Corey, I'd, if you're um, not actively making breakfast, I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on that. Oh, and, I, uh, I was going to say, I, I think you're, you're pretty close, Rep. Dexter. I mean, I think we, we do have some indirect source permits now, but they're pretty um, isolated to big parking lots. Um, and so, um, you know, there's interest in expanding it to like kind of the sources that you're talking about. You know, if there's going to be lots of vehicles, you know, huddled in an area for any kind of given amount of time, that's, that's kind of what the interest is. And so, um, you know, it's something that the Environmental Quality Commission has heard before. And so this is part of DEQ's kind of continuing work um, to look at those sources. Great, thank you. So- and Ms. Craig, uh, yeah. I just wanted to add just very quickly that I don't believe uh, you can sign up now uh, for spoken mm -hmm. testimony because the list has been made. So just in case you were uh, thinking of preparing that, you can, however, still submit written testimony. Um, so just for best use of, Time. And, and what I've found is um, sometimes, you know, we're carrying over testimony and sometimes they've opened it um, up. So it's up to the chair's discretion. So um, Nico's right that the plan is just to allow for the people who had already signed up. But sometimes we've seen that they've actually expanded that. So it's not impossible. It's reasonable to sign up and then find out. All right. Other thoughts on these bills? Um, so we're kind of covering multiples here um, as far as different areas, because we've got judiciary, we've got environment, we've got um, behavioral health, and then we're still working on my healthcare um, bills, but those just weren't as active this week. All right, any other thoughts? Well, it cannot go fast enough to me uh, this because um, it's sometimes amazing how little is done. I understand it must be uh, have enough support in the community, but um, I remember bringing my car to the DAQ and it was rejected because some light was wrong on the uh, that, on, on the dashboard. Uh, so the computers of the car said uh, this car is not okay. There was nothing wrong with the exhaust. And then next to me, there was a 50 year old uh, Ford diesel truck and it just passed because it didn't have a computer. So uh, we can improve a lot. And I would, uh, I'm a big proponent of uh, smart taxing, just make it more expensive to produce and eventually people will choose uh, what's cheapest for them. 
anyway, that was, that was my thought, but I'm glad you're working on it. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, there's always uh, different challenges with trying to run a state agency and, and DEQ does a really amazing job on a relatively small budget. Um, so yeah, I think that those computer issues are always kind of hit or miss to some degree, but um, that's exactly right. We have to incentivize the right behavior. And if polluting costs more money than replacing the engines, then that's um, effectively um, where it would go. Not immediately, like we really need to give um, business is the time to reinvest in um, getting the right equipment. And we certainly have no intention of trying to shut down businesses. We just want to find the balance. And um, the other thing I'll say about this is diesel um, has now been recognized as a carcinogen, the particulate matter from the emissions. And we know that the cancer rates in the Portland metro area is about 500 times what it should be related to these um, emissions. So this impacts all of us who live in the Portland area and clean air in Oregon is um, much, you know, we like to think that this is a, a clean and healthy state, but our air quality is much worse than um, our neighbors to the north and the south. So um, we have a lot of work uh, ahead of us if we want to kind of catch up with the the, the intentions of um, really having a healthy environment. So um, this this does impact all of us, not just the the workers. All right. Anyone else want to say anything on this before? Yeah, John. Well, actually, I was uh, going to switch to a different bill. Please. So I'll, Please. I'll stand down until until somebody uh, indicates there's nothing more to say. No, I think let's just go ahead and I, I like having the conversational. So let's talk about that and I'll try to hit on the things that other folks wanna talk about too. Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about the background check bill. And uh, one of the concerns that I and also the Gun Owners Caucus of the Democratic Party of which I'm a member uh, is concerned about is that if you look at uh, the latest statistics are 2019, that the amount of time that it takes to do a background check uh, in some instances can be days and weeks and even months. And uh, I think that if you don't have some kind of a deadline where an individual who is not precluded but uh, they from purchasing a firearm but who uh, doesn't pop up uh, evenly, we have... Uh, a couple of people with really common names like Mike Smith or something like that, and that ends up, uh, they're always delayed. And so I think that one of, one of two and perhaps two things need to be added to the bill. One is an increase in funding to allow more people or more uh, in individuals within the state police to focus on background checks so that people aren't just left in limbo for months uh, when they're going out trying to purchase a firearm. Uh, and the other thing would be to put some kind of a, a deadline in there. I mean, three days, I think I, I, we all agree, even within the Gun Owners Caucus, that's way too short a time that, that we need to give uh, the state police more time to, to check the record. But I don't know, 10 days, two weeks, something like that, where it puts a definite point in there where if someone hasn't uh, come up as definitely being a bad guy or bad gal, uh, by that point in time that they should be allowed to purchase a firearm. Yeah, thank you. And I, I did hear that um, aspect of the testimony and I absolutely think that there's um, there should be an expectation for how long this will take. Um, also on the Judiciary Committee, I was a little bit surprised by um, some of the, the reporting issues that um, lead to this, you know, incomplete data and, and incomplete records. Um, on the, the state patrols side that sometimes can cause these um, delays. So, you know, we, we need to one, keep better records and two, uh, to your point, um, you know, give some clarity if we can. Um, I think at this point, there's still room for discussion about all that. So I know that um, Rep Reynolds and, and um, the judiciary chair will be kind of addressing what amendments and whatnot need to happen. So I'll, I'll definitely take that back to Rep Reynolds and see um, what she's thinking as far as that goes. The problem of course, is that um, we can't fix the, the records that aren't complete right now. And so what do you do? Um, and I, I think that there should be some clarity around that. Yeah, my understanding is that there 
are some mandates for various state agencies and uh, uh, like uh, the police off mental health and that th type of thing to submit reports. And my understanding is they're not always doing a particularly good job of getting their support reports submitted into right. the state police so that the it's it, it could be a breakdown of another state agency yep. not providing the information they're required to provide. Yep, no, we heard about that this week actually. So that's true. And Jerry, I saw your hand up. So I just wanted to make sure we're talking about House Bill 2543. Mm -hmm. Right. So as I understand it, and please correct me, um, right now there, if you don't receive information back in three days, you are allowed to purchase a gun. That's right. And 2543 changes that. That's correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I think what John's point was, is that, you know, it, it would lift the three day window, but it doesn't reestablish any timeline. And so it could take, you know, a month um, or longer for some. So, you know, and that's not an issue with the individual as much as it is with the records. That right. Yeah. So do I also understand that we only have two out of four of our gun sense bills uh, that have had hearings? Is that also the one yeah. about restricting in public places? Is it just those two, Senate Bill 554? Um, I believe so, because yeah, I don't think Safe Storage has had a hearing, but right. we are gonna hear that um, next week in healthcare is my understanding. Oh, good. Okay, yeah. and are you accepting test written testimony on that one now? Um, you know, Nico or someone, if you can look it up um, on the healthcare agenda for next week, we can post that in the chat. Right. Um, Thanks. Yeah, I know that, uh, Rep Prusak had said that we're gonna spend, I think all week on um, gun bills. And it's interesting that they're coming to healthcare, um, which you know a lot of us would argue is, is a very reasonable place, but that's not necessarily where it traditionally has gone. So um, yeah, so I wanna um, touch on some of the other things. So Jimmy, I'm thinking about, you know, your concern about tabling the, um, vaccination bill. And, and my understanding was, um, at least when I talked to Senator Wagner, he was really committed to getting that bill through. And effectively what happened is in the setting of COVID vaccinations um, with the emergency use authorization, there was concern from some who aren't inclined to support the vaccine bill that it would mandate um, vaccines um, that haven't been as robustly proven to be safe and effective. And so even though that's not what an emergency use authorization would do, it's not officially FDA approved. And so that would not be on the table. Um, it created such a controversy that I think it was um, postponed, but I, I haven't heard that it's done, um, but maybe I'm out of the loop there as far as, cause it, it was taken to the Senate. Well, we, we in the Oregon Pediatric Society were told that it is done for this session. Mm -hmm. And um, for those, I don't know if everyone here is familiar with the bill, but what it does, it would require that children entering, uh, entering kindergarten would either have to be fully immunized uh, according to current standards or, or to have a, a medical reason um, to not be vaccinated. As, as it stands now, any parent can say that they have a personal or philosophical objection to their children being vaccinated. And that's allowed us to have pockets where in sub-schools as high as 60, 80% of children are immunized, kind of raising the specter of, of uh, vaccine preventable diseases like measles coming back. So th this bill would attempt to eliminate that non-medical exemption. And it seems like, you know, uh, the opponents successfully uh, kind of uh, spread disinformation that it would require parents to have their kids vaccinated against their will. It would require kids to be co uh, vaccinated against COVID, uh, that parents wouldn't be allowed to go to work if their kids weren't vaccinated. I mean, there was all this sort of disinformation that seemed to uh, sort of carry the day in terms of uh, in terms of winning the argument, 
Uh, so my frustration, A, has to do with the public health implications, but also sort of the process implication that disinformation is spread and wins. And it, uh, this would ap applies not only to vaccines, but it could apply to climate change. It could apply, it applies to mask wearing. It applies to all kinds of public health issues. Uh, and that, that's my frustration. So I just, yeah, welcome your thoughts on that. Yeah, so one, I um, absolutely support um, vaccines. Um, you know, I think that there's room for um, thoughtful consideration in my mind of, you know, do we mandate it or do we allow for a certain number of exemptions within a community when, you know, I, I'm not sure what the, the right answer is because I think that there was a lot of frustration around not having access to public schools if you really felt strongly that your child shouldn't be vaccinated. And, and there is, I want everyone vaccinated and yet I also understand um, the frustration that some families really have. So um, I'm not, I would support a vaccine bill, but I think that the way the last medical exemption one was written, um, there might've been a little bit of room for maybe, you know, a small portion of a community not being vaccinated and having some ability to decide, but there's no equity there. You know, who gets to, to have those exemptions um, is really hard. So it's easier just to use a, a broad stroke to just say everyone needs to have um, their kids vaccinated if they're gonna be in public schools. And, you know, Oregon is a tough um, state for that. So the disinformation, um, I share that deep concern um, because I think this has become a standard political tactic um, that has really undermined um, the verity of, of our discourse, you know, that we can't actually have fact-based or data-based discussions. We bring in, um, you know, our, our philosophical or, um, you know, frankly, um, incorrect uh, information to try to sway a group that may not be as informed. So I don't know how you control that. Um, we have gotten to a place where we not only um, tolerate it, but that it gets shared and, and um, uh, inflated. And so how do we, I think that's a societal issue. Um, and I don't know what to do about that. But what I can say is that um, we are in a political climate where these um, identity politics issues lead to shutting down the discourse and we can't get any work done um, if people start really taking hard lines. And so I think what this did is it was just one of those issues that the leadership probably wasn't willing to lead to another walkout, quite frankly, um, that they're trying to find a middle ground where we can continue to have productive conversations and not shut down um, that discourse. And do I agree with the decision? You know, it, I don't know that I should tell my leadership who, you know, has done this for a long time and, and has much more awareness of what the issues are. Um, I'm frustrated that we're not taking up the bill, but I was lobbying. I went to the Capitol to speak to this bill in 2019. Um, and, you know, I was there with what felt like thousands of people who were against the vaccinations. And, and that was, it was a really emotionally hard time for the legislators who were bombarded with, um, you know, outreach from the groups that don't want vaccination. So I think that the emotional sort of toll that that took um, is real and people just don't have the, the desire to embark on that again right now. So um, for better or worse. I think you say you don't know what to do about it, but um, I think you're doing it because uh, the only way to um, by disinformation is to, uh, well, two things, uh, provide the right information somewhere at least for to support people who are confused and are interested in this truth and there are still people around that. And the other is to uh, have great examples of public servants uh, like you. 
I'm not saying that to please you, but uh, you are uh, giving new meaning to the word public servant. When I moved from the Netherlands 20 years ago to the United States, I was surprised how uh, cynical people were about government. And it's a, well, I, I concluded that I'd never seen working government because in the Netherlands it worked just fine and people have more trust than here. Uh, but yeah, it, having lived here 20 years, I also see uh, lots of politicians are, they, they are in there just for themselves. And they come up with all kinds of things like family values and fiscal responsibility and constitution and God knows what. And they throw it all out of the window when it's uh, the opportunity is there. So um, uh, I can understand that Americans are uh, cynical about government. And the only antidote to that is to have people that are true public servants and show how it really could work. So um, yeah, you're doing it. Well, thank you for that. Um, I will say that my experience so far is that we have very reasonable people that I'm working with every day. You know, I, I've created really, I, I think trusting and, and, and good relationships with my Republican colleagues on my, um, on my committees, you know, Vice Chair Hayden and um, Rep Noble and Rep Lewis. And these are very reasonable, kind-hearted people who are there for the right reasons. Um, and so, you know, it's relational. And to your point, like, I think we all just need to show up and do the best that we can for Oregonians. And as far as whether there's gonna be a walkout, you know, there's already been a Senate walkout, you know, and my guess is that's not going to be the last time. Um, and I know that the Republicans, you know, with a super majority of Democrats feel like they don't have a lot of other options. So I personally feel like democracy is reliant on people showing up and doing their job and having these discussions. And, you know, if you haven't had the numbers to, to win the vote, then your job is to get more people to run for office of high quality who can, you know, fill those roles. But, um, you know, I think that they feel backed into a corner a bit. And so how do we do that? I think it's by establishing trust and having, you know, productive dialogue and just focusing on Oregonians rather than the politics. So. We'll see how that goes. John, it looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, two things. One, on the vaccine uh, bill, um, are there any uh, studies or information available about uh, unintended consequences like uh, groups of, of individuals who don't believe in vaccination holding their kids out of school and going to some kind of a homeschooling approach, which um, people have... Uh, impassioned opinions about that. I, I personally think that kids ought to mingle in the in the social structure of a regular school. But uh, in any event, if there's any studies on that, that might be uh, worth uh, having available or at least talking about the next time this comes around. And uh, so that's that's that. And then the other thing is the Senate did pass the uh, uh, COVID nineteen relief bill fifty to forty nine. Oh, did they really? Did that just happen? That just happened. Nice. Oh, yeah, they were. I've been following it, and I, that's fantastic. Okay. Well, whew. that is exciting. I really didn't think that was going to happen. All right. Well, there it goes. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Lauren? Yeah, thank you. I say with 20 <laughs> minutes left, I think it might be good to wrap up the vaccine update with some actionable items and then move to schools. To Great. School. Yeah, no. And so um, when you say actionable items, do you have thoughts about what you mean by that? <laughs> the get vaccinated Oregon and the new system is kind of what I was Oh, thinking. you're talking about the COVID vaccines. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. All right. No, I was thinking about the vaccine bill. So um, yeah, because I don't think any testimony or anything's active right now for that. So um, so the Get Vaccinated Oregon, you guys, if you don't mind dropping in the chat um, the different links for vaccinations, I think most folks at this point, um, at least here, if you're able to get on Zoom, you can probably get onto the OHA's website and figure out how to sign up for those. Um, but we will post that and then we also continue to share some of that on social media. Um, and you can reach out to me at rep.maxinedexter at um, oregonlegislature.gov anytime. And this great team of folks can get you connected to the information that you need. 
Um, so the schools opening, um, that wasn't one of the top priorities for anyone, but I do want to talk about that just really briefly that um, I do support the governor's um, ask to open schools by March 29th through K through five and April 19th for middle school and high school, at least in some hybrid versus all in-person model. Um, what we are seeing across the country is that it really is possible to be done in a safe way. Um, and we have ready school set, safe learner um, guidelines that the OHA has put out that are robust and, and really use multiple ways of mitigating the risk. So mask wearing, face wash or hand washing, um, ventilation and spacing. Um, and so some of our schools, especially in Portland Public, do not have the space to have all students in the buildings, even if, you know, they use every single space. So my guess is Portland Public and Beaverton in particular are going to be in some sort of hybrid model because they can't have all of the student body there at one time. Um, but, I, you know, I have two teenagers and what I will definitely say is that they're, um, they're suffering for not having, you know, in-person contact. And they also are, you know, they have two doctors for parents who, you know, were really in the middle of um, the COVID threat at the beginning. And my kids have a lot of concerns about being in buildings with other people, especially since their parents are still seeing patients. And so um, I don't know, like, what is the implications of my daughter who's 17 and I were talking about this last night, like, we've never been in this sort of reality before where there's a pandemic and there's um, virtual learning opportunities. And what is the implications for this generation going to be and, and how, how are they going to recover? And, and we were talking about like, you can learn remotely. We've established that to a certain degree, but there are children and, and, and people who are suffering as a result um, in a really real way. And so, you know, where is there some balance there? Um, and she said, you know, honestly, I'd, I'd much rather learn remotely and then get to go to my clubs and my sports and be able to have those engagements with my friends. Um, and, and, you know, if I have to choose, I would rather learn um, at home and, and still have those social interactions. So that's really what my kids are suffering from right now. And I know, you know, a lot of moms, um, are not in the workplaces right now. We have enormous impacts on um, the women who have been engaged in our economy because they are predominantly taking up the role of, of making sure kids are safe at home or, or dropping out of the workforce because of the um, impacts of home learning. So we've got to get our kids back in school. Um, and we need to figure out how to do it safely. So if anyone has thoughts on that, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, please, Linda. You're you're on mute. Thank you. Um, this isn't quite on topic, but related to COVID, I'm wondering about the inequity in, in the vaccine distribution and whether you've been hearing about that and what you think might be happening so that we can correct that. Yeah, no, thank you. And I smile because that's been a huge component of my work as um, chair of the COVID-19 subcommittee. Um, we have been asking about this um, relentlessly. And um, there are plans. It hasn't been executed well yet. We are far less likely to vaccinate our uh, members of the BIPOC community than we are um, our white members of our community. And the outreach, I think, is one issue. The language accessibility, even though OHA has done a really great job, there's you know 11 different languages that everything's translated into. It's just hard to find. Um, and not everyone has access to the internet. And so um, what they are doing now is, and they, they really are trying to figure out how to accomplish this. So some of the federally qualified health centers that um, serve these communities like Virginia Garcia, North by Northeast, um, which um, is a community clinic in North Portland that takes care of predominantly black um, folks in the neighborhood. And then um, the Yakima Farm Workers Clinic, which is, has um, 
clinics in Woodburn and other areas here in Oregon. It's not just in Yakima. Um, those groups are starting to really look at um, how do you build um, trusting relationships with the community um, if they aren't already there versus using um, already established um, community relationships. And so getting those vaccines into neighborhood schools and churches and barbershops and clinics where people already have established relationships of trust, that's probably where they're headed rather than asking people to come to a place like the convention center or something where they really don't have any reason to have trust. So um, they're really trying to partner with community-based organizations to get those vaccines more equitably out. But so far, you know, it's been more about trying to mass vaccinate. And that does protect our BIPOC communities indirectly, but directly we need to get our low wage workers and, and who are more likely to be from an underrepresented minority group vaccinated. And then also to those um, reliable community-based organizations that can get them into the community in a way that, um, is accepted um, because even if you offer, sorry, my dog is growling at the postman. Even if, um, Holly, uh, even if you, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> oh my God. Um, Holly, stop it, it's okay. Oh my God, okay. He just had to come right at 9.45. Okay, so even if, um, you have vaccine available, it doesn't mean that people are gonna take it. And so that's really the the reliability of, of the person who's distributing the vaccine is really important to some members of the community. So um, that's part of what the OHA is working on. We are keeping track of it in the COVID committee. And so they're gonna give us another update this week uh, about how they're doing and what are those, um, those tactics that they're using to get them out. Sorry, my dog is really distracting me. <laughs> um, I do want to talk about the BIPOC caucus agenda a little bit because um, I, I'm in the class that's the most diverse class of legislators um, ever in the history of Oregon. Holly, stop. And um, many of them are members of the BIPOC caucus. And then uh, Janelle Bynum is my um, chair of the Judiciary and Equitable Policing Committee subcommittee, both of which I serve on, and she is the leader of the BIPOC caucus. And there are several high priority bills um, that we are actively working on as a team, but also um, really supportive of. And so some of those, many of them are in the equitable policing um, subcommittee, the tear gas ban, and some of the database bills. I'm actually going to be working pretty hard um, to get those passed. And then um, 2813, which is the outdoor worker respiratory protection bill, um, Teresa or Rep. Alonzo Leon and I are co-chief sponsors on that one. And she had a similar bill. And so we that's one of the priority bills for the caucus. Um, and then the right to rest bill from Winsbay Campos um, is, is a really progressive um, one about, you know, how do we address houseless folks um, needing a place to, to stay if we don't have affordable housing options and supportive housing options. So those are all high priority bills. Um, you know, the right to rest one is one of the most controversial. And so if folks have an inclination to support um, that bill, I know that Rep Campos um, could really use that support. And then we um, signed on to the um, minimum wage bill that she's also the coach or the chief sponsor on. Um, which is a $17 um, minimum wage and kind of um, standardizing it to the cost of living increases over time. So did I touch on everything that everyone wanted to get to today? We talked about the environment. We talked about the BIPOC caucus. We talked about vaccines. Um, Mark, did we touch on your issues? Well, sort of. Um... I disagree with you, but um, that's fine. It, it's uh, yeah, that happens. Uh, I just hope that everything will be voluntary uh, for the vaccinations. No, but for the um, going back to school. Oh yes. So um, if parents choose to have the children at home because they're just doing fine, there are lots of kids are doing fine in school. Like your kids also say, 
I, I'm fine with online schooling, but I, I would like to go outside. Well, there are now opportunities coming up. Uh, my daughter does cheerleading, but I don't want her to be forced to go back to school. Uh, uh, not three months before we can all get vaccinated. That doesn't make, make, make no sense. And the CDC said, as I read it, uh, all these um, mitigations lower the risk, but I, Governor Brown says, it's now low risk. That's something different. I, it, it sounds the same, but um, low risk means uh, we are not giving the virus the chance to mutate further and um, and cause more death. Uh, lower risk just means uh, we're doing what we can. And so uh, it, it, we need at least give the people the, the chance to make their own decisions. Yeah, I, there there is room in this mandate um, for people to choose to continue to have distance learning. So right. there there's no intention to make families who want to keep their kids at home um, to go to school. And so I believe that that's going to be at least through the end of the year. Um, and that was clear in in the directive. Um, and I know that in the end. Um, getting kids back to school when it's safe is everyone's intention. And that level of risk tolerance is really variable depending on your life situation. So um, the risk actually is quite low and the CDC recommendations actually are um, to get kids back into school with those risk, with those um, guidelines and that it's safe. And so that the CDC just updated their recommendations about two weeks ago um, around that. And I think that that's part of what's helping the governor feel pretty confident about this. But again, you know, if it's working for your kids at school or for your kids to be doing school from home, that is absolutely, um, at this point, there's no clarity and, and that is absolutely your, your right. Um, but there are a lot of families who really are struggling who need to get their kids back to school. And, you know, there's kids with disabilities and, and um, social needs and supports with occupational therapy and other speech and things that happen at school that they can't get at home that really are putting them behind too. Well, medical pressure of kids are already in school. Two weeks ago, my wife works as a nurse there. So uh, we, Great. we know about it. Good. All right, Nico, what was that? 2360? Oh, you guys are talking about the right to rest. Sorry, thank you. I'm glad that you guys are updating the, the chat there. Um, anything else? Glenn, what did we, you mentioned something that I'm trying to remember. Well, actually I, I let's see, am I on mute? Um, no, you're, you're, I can hear you. Okay. No, no, actually I have issues. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't have issues, but they're really not germane to things that are happening right now. So I think I'll just save it for another another time. Um, I was going to ask the question because I only really know what I read in the newspaper, but this whole issue about get, getting kids back into schools, I, I thought that that at least the impression you get from reading the Oregonian <laughs> is is that it would happen sooner if the public unions that how the teachers and school staff would be supportive of it. So this is just me reading articles and editorials and things like that. So I don't know how accurate that is or not. I, I was frustrated as an elder citizen going through the whole vaccination process that public educators were put in advance of elder citizens, but I understand the reasoning why they were. I may not have agreed with it, but I understand it. But what I don't understand is why it wasn't said as a condition of being put first, you would go back to school when we want you to go back to school. And if they weren't prepared to accept that condition, then why were they put first? That's, that's my frustration. And it mostly comes, like I said, from just generally reading the newspaper. <laughs> No, and I think, so you, you're you not alone and there's no right answer. And I have said this a million times, so I apologize for those who have heard it, but I will keep saying it. When there is um, scarcity, there's no equity. And so trying to equitably distribute something that there's not enough of is just never going to work. So um, the governor did break from CDC recommendations by putting um, educators ahead of others. Um, 
and she's taken a lot of heat for that. And um, her, my understanding of her intentions was to decrease the barriers for teachers and educators and staff um, being able to feel safe going back to school. And so I think, you know, from the beginning, her priority has been trying to get kids back into school. And we do have strong public um, unions for our teachers here. And, and I believe in unions and I, I think it's a good thing. Um, and it does create more tension when there's a difference of opinion like this. And so the West Coast um, has stronger teacher unions and we are behind the rest of the country in a lot of ways getting our kids back to school. Is that good or bad? It really depends on which side of um, that um, philosophic debate you're on. Um, so right now we're just moving ahead with where we're at and I absolutely understand and um, don't necessarily disagree that it was frustrating to have public um, or the educators ahead of others. Um, especially for me who takes care of a lot of elderly folks with lung problems, you know, that was hard for me to know that my patients weren't getting uh, the vaccine as quickly. Um, but yet now we're really seeing that this is happening and, and we are where we are. So, um, and to Mark's point, you know, we at, you know, this week or yesterday, over 2,300 people died in the U.S., from COVID-19. And when, you know, we passed the CARES Act, you know, way back, um, there were just a couple hundred and not just, but, you know, our tolerance for the impact of this um, disease or this infection has really increased. Like we are accepting far more deaths now and being much more relaxed about it than we were at the beginning. And that is troubling to me that we, somehow have come to accept that thousands of people dying a day um, from COVID is, is reasonable. Um, so there is a challenge there. And yet, you know, I think after a year of, of all of this, people are just anxious to move forward. So I, I don't know what the right answer is. And I share concerns about the variants. I see that we're almost at 10, but um, you know, Oregon has had a dramatic drop in infections and then it stabilized this last week and it's starting to go up again. And in the next four weeks or so, we really are gonna see B117, the variant increasing. And so if I leave you with nothing else today, um, it's with the knowledge, I hope, that we're not out of the woods yet. Um, we still have a lot of work to do. And so uh, maintaining social distancing and wearing your mask and being um, thoughtful about the exposure that you put yourself at risk for um, is really important because these variants that we have um, are much more infectious. And now we saw not only the B117 variant, but the B117 with the Brazil variant that actually is resistant to uh, the, the immunity that the vaccine brings with it. And if that were to start increasing, we have a real problem on our hands. So um, just continue to do the things that we can, recognizing that we're all human and you know, and if you're vaccinated, you are much safer. So get your vaccines if you're eligible. Make sure that your friends and family get their vaccines. That is the number one thing that we can do um, right now to decrease the number of deaths. And so um, I guess that's where I'm going to leave it for today, unless anyone has any last comments. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Here.